Today we wanted to talk some mostly open world game worlds that feel truly lived in. We're taking a look at game worlds that truly put the work in to make it feel like you're in a real, alive place. From artificial intelligence of citizens to just general art and level design and vibe, we've got a lot of fun and exciting places to talk about here, so let's just get started off with number 10 and talk about the obvious one. Skyrim. Ah, Skyrim, of course. Bethesda has been building great game worlds for the Elder Scrolls universe for a long time already. My personal favorite is Morrowind, but most recently we have Skyrim, the biggest mainstream success for the series yet, and absolutely a fascinating living world that a bunch of fans sunk tons of hours living and questing in. Skyrim's map is riddled with not only things to do, but random things to stumble across. Whether it's some bandits hiding out in a cave, an old lady living in the middle of the woods, it all feels like a convincing region of Tamriel where people actually live and breathe in this harsher northern region. Sure, it technically feels a bit older than a lot of the other games we're going to mention on this list, but it still has some taverns with interesting people, city streets with civilians and guards who react to you as they go about their day and go to sleep at night, blacksmiths hammer away all day, sawmills make lumber. As significant as you are in the story, like you as the Dragonborn are to this world, you can still just walk around and be in it. The Elder Scrolls games always just do a really good job of feeling like living, breathing places. But over at number 9, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. It's a vastly underrated Assassin's Creed game. Sure, you know, it falls prey to a lot of the typical trappings of the open world games that people don't like, but still, it took a lot of lessons from the tech and systems built off from Assassin's Creed Unity and plopped it in an insanely big, detailed, and almost modern game world. It takes place in London, England in the late 1860s, basically the closest to modern times Assassin's Creed has ever been, and has all of the stuff of a world going through the Industrial Revolution you would come to expect, you know, soaring buildings, multiple stories, stories, uh, steel everywhere, factories working non-stop, a bustling main river crowded with boat traffic, shipping goods everywhere, pretty much accurately representing London, England as the powerhouse of the world it was in that period of time. Not only that, uh, streets were wide and filled with not only detail on the sides of the streets and people, but bustling horse and carriage traffic. Something that just seems very complicated to implement into a game like this. You don't see it in games often, and yet here it is. All of this horse and buggy traffic. It's cool. People coming and going on the streets and bridges and carriages of all shapes and sizes and purposes make it all feel so alive. Not only that, there's also trains that are persistently cruising around the whole map. It's a big, wide, polluted city with rich political districts, working class districts, factory zones, deeply poor areas that all feel convincingly real and not only lived in, but like really lived in. It feels like a really old city bursting at the seams and it's cool to experience. Now over at number eight, let's talk about Albion, the world of the Fable series, particularly Fable 1 and 2, because 3 was just kind of a rough game. But Albion is a very lived-in world from a look and feel standpoint. I don't think people talk enough about how deeply beautiful and just kind of like comfortable and cozy these worlds feel. There's Oakvale, you know, the charming little village filled with ancient stone walls, cobblestone paths, little wooden townhouses. People amble about throughout the day, each have their own home, and it feels like a fantasy village that has been there for a thousand years. Venture out into the woods and fields and you'll find big gnarled old trees that look like they've been there forever and really hammer home the game's like really good cozy fall tone. And then of course there's Bowerstone the big city of the original game and the even bigger city from Fable 2. Bowerstone has the same bustle of NPCs, but it's richly detailed. The ancient cobblestone city has high castle walls, ramshackle buildings tucked in, some interesting vegetation growing in weird places, and also a lot, a lot of chickens. Fast forward 500 years to that same Bowerstone in Fable 2, and the city is absolutely massive and feels like a giant urban sprawled maze filled with secrets of worn paths, lots of bands of people living in alleyways, shops, nobles, and soaring buildings, and an epic castle. It doesn't feel like realistically alive, but it does still have a lot of life, if that makes sense. This is really only scratching the surface of everything Albion has to offer in terms of convincing locations, but yeah, we, we love Fable and its world. Next over at number 7, Grand Theft Auto V's entire state of San Andreas, of course. Uh, the city of Los Santos and its surrounding regions are riddled with fun details and wacky pedestrians. The world just feels so lived in thanks to the fact that there is so much hidden beneath the surface. Li I mean, literally, there are secrets in the ocean if you're willing to explore them. Not only that though, just hidden corners of the map, woods, 
mountains, there's always something weird to find. Now, of course, the city of Los Santos feels unique and alive, you know, with people bustling around, cars, traffic, typical open world crime game stuff. They have a really nice eye for detail down to homeless people sheltering themselves and the Hollywood upper class being themselves. But Grand Theft Auto V is also unique for pulling off the less populated rural areas and making them feel like people actually live there, not just like a boring flat landscape with a few trailers like many other games simply do it. No, no, no. Up by Sandy Shores in particular. Yes, it's mostly trailer parks, but with convenience stores, strip malls, parking lots, and abandoned buildings, it really makes you feel like a place people exist in and not just a goofy parody. Grand Theft Auto 4 and 5 in particular just feel like convincing real places, even if the majority of your interaction with people is just blowing them up. Now over at number six, let's talk about sleeping dogs. The Hong Kong depicted in Sleeping Dogs isn't like a one-to-one -one accurate or meticulous recreation or anything like that, but it works so hard to make you feel the bustle of one of the biggest metropolitan areas in Asia. The developers did do tons of research in person and, and took hundreds of thousands of photographs to nail the vibe and feel accurately. This city area is split into four districts that all feel distinctly different, and throughout there are like packed highways, bustling narrow city streets filled with people and umbrellas, uh, tons of details like market stalls, wet markets, convenience stores, people selling their wares, electrical boxes, wires, trash, tons of neon signs beautifully reflecting onto the rain-soaked streets. The coastal areas have busy fisheries modeled after the ones in real life. It's a stylized city, a video game city, yeah, but you really feel the hustle of it despite the game's age. Play the remastered version, it's really great. Let's move on to number five and talk about Yakuza. This one might be a, a, definitely a lot smaller than the other ones on this list. It's not a whole continent or a city or what have you, but the district of Kamurocho in the Yakuza series is one of the densest bustling lived in worlds we've seen in a video game in a long time. Sure, you're not jumping in vehicles and tearing through the streets, but the streets of Kamurocho are just jam packed full of people living their lives and mulling about the streets streets and businesses, tons of buildings for you to go into and side activities to be found. It's an incredible facsimile of Tokyo's red light district, Kabukicho, and the level of care and detail put into fleshing out this world and making it feel as authentic and lived in is frankly astonishing. And like we said, it's just chock full of stuff to do. You can roam the streets and take it all in, or you can explore the many restaurants, bars, clubs, arcades, bowling alleys, gyms, internet cafes, convenience stores, everything the city has to offer, just like in real life. This is hard to explain, but the game game somehow really nails the feel of like a late night trip down the street and walking into a convenience store in a big city. We've done it a thousand times and for some reason Yakuza really nails it. And because Kamurocho is also always the setting of the mainline Yakuza games, you get to see the evolution of the city and how it changes over time from the 80s and Yakuza 0 all the way up to Yakuza 6's modern 2016 version of the city. And seeing how that city changes with new technological cultural influences all in a believable way is really something. Obviously there's all the clan power struggle stuff, but even just to have civilians in the streets go about their day. It's a world that eventually came to transcend the game it was introduced, which is pretty awesome if you ask us. But over at number four, we've said this a million times, but love or hate the division games and the whole live service games model thing, you can't deny that the developers Massive Entertainment build some incredibly detailed, lived in feeling worlds. The Division 1 was Midtownish New York City, and The Division 2 was a two-scale Washington DC and Lower Manhattan in a DLC expansion. As someone from New York and someone who has visited DC many times as an East Coaster, these are without a doubt some of the most convincingly recreated cities in a video game, straight up. And what's more impressive is the fact that the cities are totally abandoned. A widespread bio-attack virus led to mass deaths and evacuations, so it's empty besides freedom fighters and bad guys and occasional civilians, but it still all always feels so lived in, from details like makeshift shelters to the left behind stuff like pets, bikes, luggage everywhere. You believe these division cities were at one point real cities where people lived and did stuff and then had to leave in a hurry, and now these environments are just shooting galleries. But still, they look damn good. Now of course, down to number three, you know we were going to mention it, the continent, or the world of The Witcher 3, is totally a no-brainer for a great lived-in feeling video game world. It feels distinctly medieval, but convincing. The game is filled with detail and NPCs that look like they're actually doing stuff and not just pantomiming. The cities like Novigrad in particular 
feel dense with packed market squares, shops riddled with details, busy docks, there are poorer sections with dilapidated collapsing old wood buildings, and upper class sections with nice landscaping, better views, different architecture, and different people walking around. For better or worse, uh, these little details do help the world feel more alive and real. Not only that, the wide open spaces also feel touched by humans and creatures too. To like a spooky abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods you can stumble across, to crumbling castles, to the population itself, you know, see people out there working in the farm fields, soldiers out on the roads, rivers occupied and being worked on by fishermen. From rural to urban, it feels like a living, working region. Not to mention later game areas where people are dealing and living in completely different environments and climates. Also, especially to the expansion land of Toussaint as well, that feels like a convincing Mediterranean medieval paradise with a sinister side. I always say that The Witcher 3 was a success because of two things. Obviously, number one, players fell in love with Geralt, but number two, they fell in love with the world he inhabits. Now down to number two, let's talk about Dishonored. The original Dishonored really blew the doors down in terms of world design and art direction. The adventure takes place in the industrial city of Dunwall. It's kind of like an aesthetic mix of like Victorian era London, some steampunk, some City 17 from Half-Life 2. It's all over the place, man. It's like sci-fi, but never quite like you've seen it before. Dishonored 2 expands on Dunwall with the coastal city of Karnaka. All of the Dishonored universe feels lived in, particularly because of how unique it is, how detailed it is, how much time they took to really add in the working class details, you know, shops, fisheries, taverns, stuff like that. Uh, and lots of trash and, and dead things too. Karnaka is powered by wind and Dunwall primarily lives off of whale oil. And the fact that the game goes to great lengths to show you evidence of that makes it feel like a more alive place, a downtrodden place held together by corruption and industry. Despite it being so foreign, exotic, and strange, you believe it all and it makes sense. Props to Arcane Studios for that, really. But down to number one, Red Dead Redemption 2. We can't talk big, detailed open world games without mentioning the most recent Rockstar Games one. Of course, there's a lot of Red Dead Redemption 2's world that is just open space, prairies, mountains, marshes, and whatnots. The cities and towns, while spread out quite a bit, are incredibly detailed, full of people just doing their own thing, and all have their own personality and flavor, if that makes sense. The game starts you out introducing you to Valentine, which is pretty much your stereotypical Wild West town, complete with inn, saloon, a bunch of shops, and people just living and working. But even that sleepy town is chock full of detail, from the signage on the walls, to the imperfect way that the buildings are built and weathering, to people building new buildings that are built over time, to the muddy streets. It really shows that this town has been here long before Arthur Morgan showed up and will continue to be long after he's gone. You get that from every town, really. Take Ansberg, for example. It's a rough and tumble coal mining and shipping town. It's dirty, its people are rougher around the edges, it's got a bit of its own thing going on. Then travel down to Saint-Denis and you've got a way more modernized, industrious, and dare I say, classy setting. Made in that New Orleans mode and it shows in the environment. It, it's denser both in population and in the way buildings are placed. It's got trolley cars and electricity, big fancy saloons and houses, uh, factories. The people all speak the local tongue with their own accents. Here you can buy higher end clothing and other products. It's, it's a whole different world from what you've been used to in the other regions in the game. And it's kind of jarring at first that they actually went out of their way to build a full 1800 city here. That's just a few examples. The game is packed with interesting detailed regions that all have their own flair. You know, it's some of the best work Rockstar has done by a country mile as far as world building goes. It also feels like Arthur is merely a visitor there, not just the world made for Arthur, if that makes sense. And we absolutely love it. But those are some really lived in feeling game worlds that we wanted to wax poetic about for a minute. Thank you guys for listening to us. But most importantly, we want to hear from you guys in the comments, some game worlds that you really feel are truly alive, truly lived in, have been around forever, and you love diving into. If you got your own list, let us know in the comments. We can always make a part two of this video because this was fun. But if you enjoyed this video, clicking the like button is the best way you can help us out, man. We really appreciate that. And if you're new, consider subscribing, maybe hitting that notification bell because we put out videos every single day. But as always, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next time.